Can Georgia and Russia resolve their differences? The Kremlin responds to insults and protests with flight bans and threats against Georgia. Relations haven't been this bad since their war 11 years ago. What's behind their latest dispute? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Nastasia Tay. Georgia and Russia have had a tense relationship for decades, stretching back to the days of the Soviet Union. They fought a war 11 years ago over two disputed Georgian regions. Relations are bad again now. An invitation for a Russian politician to speak in Georgia's parliament provoked riots in the capital Tbilisi. And regular protests have demanded the withdrawal of Russian troops from the breakaway regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. President Vladimir Putin responded by banning Russia's airlines from flying to Georgia, a popular holiday destination for Russian tourists. And Russian MPs demanded trade sanctions after a Georgian TV host launched a foul-mouthed tirade aimed at Putin. As for sanctions, I would rather not do it out of respect for the Georgian people. For the sake of restoring full ties between Russia and Georgia, I would not impose anything that could complicate our relations. Andrew Simmons has more outside Parliament in Tbilisi. It all started here, June the 20th, an appearance by a Russian Member of Parliament addressing the Georgian Parliament. That caused uproar. Now there are demands for the resignation of Georgi Gaharia, the Interior Minister. Uh, the demonstrators have been here every evening since. Many were injured in what they say was heavy policing ordered by what they say is a pro-Russian interior minister. And they say the government has to be less pro-Russian because Georgians don't have uh, what they deserve uh, from the present parliament. The demands there, the tick in the box at the top, a demand for proportional representation in parliament, which has been granted. At the bottom, a tick on the release of prisoners. They're said to be political prisoners taken during the demonstrations. The red mark, well, that's the question mark over the interior minister. These demonstrators say they're serious and they're not giving in. Despite Vladimir Putin's softening, apparent softening uh, in his insistence that the lower house of parliament in Russia uh, should not go ahead with further sanctions uh, against Georgia. Uh, they're already uh, banning flights here and that's affecting the tourist industry. There's a lot of concern, although many people believe that this is being overhyped in some areas, although there really is an underlying concern about Russian actions against Georgia. Now, diplomatic ties have been broken since the five-day war in Georgia 11 years ago. Georgian troops launched a military operation against separatist forces in the breakaway regions of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Russian troops invaded to support the separatists. Hundreds on all sides were killed. When the war ended, Russia built permanent military bases in what they call independent states. Georgia and its allies condemn what they call illegal military occupation. Over the years, trade and tourism gradually improved, but Russia opposes Georgia's aspirations to join NATO and the European Union. Well, now let's bring in our panel. In Paris, we have Tornike Godadze. He's a former deputy foreign minister of Georgia who is in charge of relations with the European Union and NATO. In London, we have Domitilla Sagramoso. She is a lecturer at the Department of War Studies at King's College in London. And in Moscow, we have Russian defense and military analyst Pavel Felgenhauer. Welcome to you all. Tornike, I'd like to start with you, because you're a supporter of these protests, and, they, and we are expecting more today. Um, I believe the Georgian Prosecutor General's Office actually charged an MP, who is a leader of the opposition party, with inciting violence amid the unrest. So how involved is the opposition party yeah. at the moment um, with the demonstrations that we've been seeing, and what are the demands of the demonstrators? So demonstrators are uh, mainly uh, um, unhappy with the, with the policy of the Georgian government vis-à-vis -vis Russia, because in recent years we saw the, uh, um, clearly the increase of Russian influence in this country, uh, both in the society via the, uh, the attempts of, this, uh, of uh, hybrid 
uh, warfare from the Russian side and also on, on the Georgian government. So Russia is uh, spending a lot of money uh, in promoting some pro-Russian and anti-Western groups in Georgian politics and in Georgian society. These groups are highly aggressive, uh, uh, xenophobic, uh, anti-Western, anti-Muslim, by the way, anti-minority. Um, generally speaking, and uh, the Georgian government has been uh, very passive in opposing Russia's policies in, in this country. So uh, today and uh, since uh, uh, the June 20th, uh, all these people who are gathered and they, not they are not representing any political party in Georgia. This is the Georgian society altogether who is uh, mobilized and who is uh, rallying against this uh, um, let's say, uh, appeasing or not, uh, not very active policies of the Georgian government to defend the interests of the country. And it started, as you mentioned in the beginning, with the visit of, uh, of a Russian delegation. And they were invited by this government. And this delegation is part of the Russian soft power because they represent an interparliamentary assembly of orthodox nations. And we know how, the, how Russia is manipulating orthodox religion uh, especially in the countries like Georgia. So the, the fact that Georgian government tries to show that this is an attempt of one political party, uh, the former uh, party that were in, uh, was in government in Georgia, uh, this is simply not true. So most of these people um, are against also this manipulation and uh, accusing only uh, a representative or one of the leaders of this party as being the, the author of a coup d'etat attempt is simply ridiculous. Well, Tornike, you say that the government has behaved in a, in a passive way. I want to read you a statement now from the Georgian president that she posted on Facebook after that initial unrest that we saw on, on June 20th. She, she said, Russia is our enemy and occupier. The fifth column it manages may be more dangerous than open aggression. Only Russia benefits from a split in the country and society and internal confrontation, and it's the most powerful weapon today. Now, Pavel in Moscow, we're hearing the president accuse Moscow of being involved in triggering some of this unrest in order to sow division in Georgia. Is there any truth in that? Uh, well, the, you should understand, of course, that the Georgian president is more or less a figurehead and uh, the, she doesn't have any real power. Uh, but, of course, she wants to have more power and more influence. And that was a kind of more PR statement. Uh, that Russia has, of course, uh, and has been seeking uh, pockets of support and wants a pro-Russian government in Belize. That's absolutely true. Uh, but right now, apparently, Moscow is very much uh, uh, in anguish that there is something bad really happening in Georgia. This began some time ago, but now they see uh, the kind of uh, 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 possible outline of a coward revolution or a Maidan, like in, like in Ukraine in 14, of a, a kind of pro-Russian government, or at least partially pro-Russian, being violently replaced by a pro-Western one. And that's, of course, very bad. And Russia is trying to put pressure on, on uh, Belize uh, to, for, to kind of prevent this happening. Well, seeing as, as that's what you're thinking from Moscow, and I see Domitella um, is nodding there in London, um, let me ask you, because last year, um, Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev, um, he, he had ambitions for a full-scale dialogue between Moscow and Tbilisi, and now we're seeing the threat of Russian sanctions and, and insults being hurled both sides. What's changed? How much of this is about Russia-Georgia tensions, and how much of this is about domestic Georgian politics? Um, I think it's very hard to sort of uh, separate or disaggregate the two because they two are very much interconnected. And of course, as was mentioned by the other speakers, uh, Russia has a strong influence on affairs uh, in Georgia. And uh, as we know, there is a very powerful um, uh, oligarch oligarchic figure, Ivanishvili, who is really behind uh, decision making. And he has tried in the last years 
uh, since his uh, people have been in power, to sort of soften the rhetoric uh, against Russia and try to sort of mend fences. But at the same time, uh, there, is a, there is a trend in Georgia towards a closer rapprochement with the West and uh, with the European Union and NATO. Uh, so to a certain extent, of course, there are issues of concern of a domestic nature related to the economic situation, the corruption, the heavy-handedness of the police, and above all, the perception that Ivanishvili is sort of overpowerful and his interior minister is sort of his representative uh, in, in government. So there is great dissatisfaction, which is uh, domestic, but is in a way related to Russia, and also to the fact that uh, Russia still uh, has a very strong presence, uh, uh, an almost occupation, if we want to call it, of these two regions of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. And there is a process really of annexing these regions to Russia. There were agreements signed in 2014, 2015, which uh, to all intent and purposes really brought these regions almost into Russia, especially if we think about South Ossetia. And this occurred after Georgia had signed an association agreement with the European Union. And there is a lot of concern, of course, about NATO membership, because this is constantly being reiterated in NATO, and it is a desire expressed by Georgians, and it is in the Constitution. Uh, so, of course, uh, these two elements are, uh, are together, the domestic and the external, and the presence of Russia is important uh, in that way. And I think uh, the, the Russian worry, above all, if I, if I have a moment, if I may say, is also that these demonstrations have a very strong sort of anti-Putin undertone. Uh, and, and I think that from the perception of the Kremlin, it is not good to have a revolution, sort of a change of government succeed, uh, which has as one of its main sort of inspirations and slogans, you know, to insult uh, the president of Russia. And I think that that is probably something which creates a lot of concern in, in Moscow. Tom Matilla, you're talking about all of this anti-Putin sentiment, and we certainly heard some of that on Sunday. Um, Tornike, I want to ask you about that, that Georgian TV host who launched launched this tirade, speaking in Russian, seemingly addressing Russian President Putin himself, calling him a filthy invader, insulting his mother. Um, and he said, at one point, Putin's slaves should get out of Georgia. How have Georgians reacted? And, and do many of them share that view? There, there were a series of reactions. First of all, most of people were, to be honest, quite shocked, because uh, even if 99% uh, of Georgia's population dislikes strongly Putin because he is the responsible for the occupation of Georgia, for the invasion of this country, etc., etc., for the for the embargoes, etc., for many bad things for, for this country. But they were still quite surprised, and many of them found that uh, this um, uh, the TV presenters' uh, tirade, as you said, was a bit, uh, 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 to say it softly, uh, uh, tasteless. Uh, but then the reaction of the Georgian government was even worse, because immediately, and it was a Sunday evening, they made statements um, uh, condemning not only the journalists, that we, we can understand, and uh, uh, calling the international community uh, to condemn the journalist of a private television because of his uh, um, outrageous remarks uh, about the president of the occupying country. So the, those people who first were surprised and disappointed or angry about the journalists became even more more angry against the government, because this is not the reaction of a government, of a, of a sovereign country. Uh, and uh, they managed the government, I mean, the government managed to uh, to, uh, uh, to attract uh, all this criticism uh, towards the, the, the government. And the next day, uh, Vladimir Putin made extremely uh, strange remarks about the Georgian history and start, starting to lecture the whole Georgian, not only Georgian, but the international community about the history of Georgia starting from the 18th century, the, a totally fake uh, a version of the Georgian history. So uh, all this, uh, um, uh, this incident uh, is, is just revealing what is very old. Uh, Russia has, uh, is trying to undermine the independence and the territorial integrity of Georgia since Georgia's independence, at least. I'm not going farther in the history, but since 1991, Georgia had uh, uh, two separatist wars, uh, numerous uh, attempts of, uh, of coup d'etat, assassination of the president, etc. And all behind all this uh, uh, all these uh, things were, was Russia and Russian secret services. Uh, uh, Russia's reaction after the independence of Georgia was to destroy Georgia's independence and to 
uh, to prevent this country from getting closer uh, with, uh, with Europe and with the West. And that was the choice of the Georgian population. Uh, again, the, what happened uh, last week is only one moment, one uh, episode of this uh, many years of position between uh, Russia and Georgia. Well, Tornike, you say that Putin then gave his own version of history, but one of the things that he did do was push back on the Duma when they wanted to impose sanctions against Georgia. So, Pavel and Moscow, can you explain that to me? What's the rationale for, for going against Parliament and saying, no, no, um, let's not impose sanctions on mineral water and, and wine um, and, and remittances, and, and let's rather continue pursuing um, better relations with Georgia after you've been insulted in that way? Uh, well, Putin said that this journalist, uh, that it doesn't matter, that he is just kind of a journalist and let him say what he wishes, and in general was trying to play the good policeman. Of course, I mean, parliament does not decide in Moscow anything about uh, uh, sanctions. Even legally, they can't. It's only the president that can impose sanctions or not. So parliament had a vote to ask the government to propose to Putin to impose sanctions. And Putin said, no, I won't. And, well, that he's, that's even legally in his power. And uh, de facto, uh, the Russian Duma is uh, just a rubber stamp that uh, puts forward uh, legislation that the Kremlin tells it to. Uh, so this, yes, it's uh, sending a, a very — Putin was sending a very powerful message to Tbilisi, that the, you should put uh, — that the present uh, Georgian government should put their uh, house in order, that they should clamp down on the uh, uh, demonstrators and on the opposition, impose order. And then the, there will be no sanctions, then the ban on travel, on this air tra direct air travel between Russia and uh, Georgia will be lifted, and everything's going to be okay. It's clear that uh, Moscow is, uh, most, is very ups, uh, being uh, upset for some years, increasingly, uh, with the Georgian policy of the Georgian government of the Georgian party of the Georgian dream to kind of balance between the West and Moscow, uh, to have increased uh, economic relations with, Georgia, with Russia, while at the same time with the European Union and having uh, military exercises with American troops this year landed in Georgia and having exercises with heavy equipment. And Moscow does, uh, didn't like it. I mean, this, what's happening right now, had a prehistory of uh, Russia wants to see Georgia solidly inside the Russian sphere, uh, losing Georgia and make, uh, allowing it to become, a, 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 say, Ukraine, as seen right now as a, a four, four post for the West. Is absolutely unacceptable for the for Moscow. Well, I want to ask you a little more about this flight ban, Domitilla, in London, um, because it, it's not a small thing. It sounds like a small thing, cutting off flights, but that's 1.4 million Russian tourists who travelled to Georgia just last year, and that's something like 10% of Georgia's annual tourism revenue. Um, they could lose $300 million. How much of an impact would that have on Georgia? And subsequently, we've also seen this this campaign to try to get more people to come to Georgia as tourists, and that's been supported by a lot of Western diplomats. So following along with this theme of Russia, Russia sorry, um, Georgia um, trying to cosy up with the West, um, could that galvanise more support? This flight ban could potentially actually bring the West and Georgia closer together. Uh, well, I mean, there is no doubt, as you mentioned, and the figures that you gave, you know, accurately portray, you know, the relevance that uh, Georgia, uh, ha that Russian tourism has for Georgia, and also uh, the say, the, you know, the, the trade of agricultural products, wine and mineral water. If there would be a ban, would be very serious. So it has an impact on on the economy, and Georgia is trying to find ways around uh, by trying to uh, to help uh, Russia arrive in Georgia because tourism is a very important uh, source of income for many. So it is going to hit the economy as it did when there were many other uh, sort of uh, trade embargoes in the past starting in 2006. So Georgia has already faced 
these sort of pressures. Um, but, uh, I mean, both sides, uh, both governments have to uh, sort of walk this very tight rope of trying to keep good relations going, but at the same time addressing this reality for the Georgians to address the demands and the requests of the people in the street, which who seem not to want to go away, and Russia at the same time trying to do something, not losing face, but at the same time not going too far uh, to the point of really weakening uh, the Georgian Green Coalition and then paving the way for a government that is a lot more sort of uh, anti-Russian and a lot more pro-Western. Um, I think Georgia is, is already on a path of closer rapprochement with the West anyway. Uh, and that, I think, is not going to change. Uh, and to a certain extent, Moscow is trying to limit the damage uh, because uh, the presence it has in these two republics uh, and its policies in Georgia have really pushed the Georgians a lot more into the Western hands. And that was a policy they really wanted to pursue uh, already since the mid or early 1990s. So um, I think that uh, it's going to be a, a, bit, uh, a bit challenging for the two leaders in the, or the two regimes in the two countries to address this crisis. Uh, but, I mean, to talk about being further into the hands of the West, I think, is not really the adequate way of, of uh, describing this, because um, most regimes or most governments in Georgia have generally supported closer rapprochement with the West, but they have uh, have done that in different approaches. And this government has tried in a certain way to, to not to antagonize Moscow so that they could at least develop better economic ties and visa regimes. But the path towards closer rapprochement with the West is there. And this is shown not only in the economic side, but also in the military field. As was mentioned, there are military exercises, there are close cooperation. Very recently, the Secretary General of NATO again uh, reaffirmed that Georgia will become a member of NATO. But of course, uh, this also remains sort of in a limbo. So Russia worries that this process of membership and closer military rapprochement uh, could happen. And I I think that is a real worry of the Kremlin, as was mentioned by, by Pavel in Moscow. I want to bring Tornike in here because, um, Tornike, you were very involved with Georgia's relationship with both the EU and with NATO. And, and some people do argue that conflict with Russia gives Georgia more opportunity for continued Western patronage. And it gives them more defence aid, it makes them more important for a relatively small country, it, it potentially um, strengthens their bid to join NATO. So it's in their interest? Conflict with Russia is in Georgia's interest? Um, um, just uh, I, I'll come back a little bit to what was said. I, I mainly agree with uh, both of uh, uh, speakers about the... Uh, the economic uh, uh, relations with Russia and political relations with Russia. Um, the fact that Vladimir Putin uh, said so, so far he's not going to impose sanctions is that uh, Russia doesn't want to punish a, a government which is the, uh, the less uh, anti-Russian, uh, government, less critical uh, government uh, towards Russia uh, almost since the independence of Georgia in the 90s. So uh, if they uh, um, impose again sanctions or if they adopt some aggressive measures, it will punish, of course, this government, and they, they, they don't want it. Uh, now, coming back to, the, to, to, to Europe and to the West, um, uh, in several years ago, I was the person who negotiated uh, the association, association agreement and uh, free trade agreement with the European Union. So, uh, after that, in 2014, the agreement in, entered into force. Uh, it should have uh, really helped Georgia to increase uh, EU's share in Georgia's foreign trade. What's happened in parallel was that Russia, in order to thank or to encourage this uh, government that, uh, of Georgian dream, they also uh, uh, lifted sanctions ag against Georgia. So we saw that Russia's share in Georgia's foreign trade really um, uh, growing faster than uh, uh, the European Union's share in Georgia's uh, foreign trade. This is something that is politically very dangerous because Okay, it gives some, uh, some, uh, you know, some, some, some dynamics to the local economy, but at the same time, we know that the, the trade with Russia is very much dependent on political circumstances, mm -hmm. and we have seen that in the past, in the 90s, in the years 2000, when the energy blockade was imposed on Georgia, or blockade on agricultural uh, foodstuff that was sent to Russia was blocked. 
only for political reasons. So Georgian government should have been more, uh, uh, more prudent or precautious when they started these uh, uh, relations with, with economic relations with Russia and did not put all the energy to develop more economic ties with the, with the European Union. Of course, it's bad to to have no 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 trade with with Russia or no no Russian tourists. No one wants that in Georgia. The Georgians are those who want to uh, to dissociate. And Georgians were the first after the war in 2008 to lift the visas for Russian citizens uh, to come and to visit Georgia, despite the war, despite the uh, absence of uh, diplomatic relations. It was already in 2011 that the Russian uh, citizens could come to Georgia without visas. And the, there was no reciprocation, by the way, because Georgian citizens still need a very long and complicated procedures to get uh, to, to, to visit Russia. So these attempts uh, were positive and were made, by the way, by the former government at the beginning. But Georgia should be very, very cautious about not making the country dependent on Russia economically, because we know that all this, uh, at the end, is very political. Tornike Godadze and Domitila Sagramoso and Pavel Felgenhauer, thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nastasia Tay, and the whole team here, bye for now.